Hello, my name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. I'd like to welcome ILYA viewers and guests. We have another great webinar for you. And this project was made possible by an education grant from the ILYA Foundation and support from Sales Inc. I'd like to welcome our guests tonight, Will Hurth, the moderator, Colin Rowe, Coy Herrick, Ed Cox, and Ben Porter. All of our panelists have extensive sailing experience and accomplishments. I'm sure you'll be entertained and enlightened by all of their knowledge. For those of you that would like to visit this again, go to ilya.org or salesing.com. So on with the show. All right, guys, welcome back to the second episode of Shooting the Breeze with Bill. I'm your host, Will Hurth, and thank you for joining us tonight as we take a journey down the rum line. Last week, we talked about college sailing, the ins and outs of how to navigate getting into college sailing, coming out of expos, coming out of high school sailing. Today, we're going to take a little bit different path. We're going to be talking about the little guys, the guys that don't really get the mic. They don't really get the glory, but my God, do they help get the trophies. We're going to be talking about crews, crews throughout the IOA. We're not going to be talking about the skippers. We traditionally only hear from skippers after a race win or regatta win, but what about the guys that sit in front of them, the guys that cross the finish line first? Today, I have a great panel with me, guys that I've sailed with for over 10 years, people that I admire, absolute athletes, studs, soon to be Hall of Fame crews of the IOA, Jibman, Bowman, Spinnaker trimmers, middle guys, Seaboat crews, MC crews, A Scout crews, the whole nine yards, we got it all. So, without further introduction, let's get right into it. Guys, welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having so, us. This will be fun. I'm so glad I called each one of these guys up individually and said, I'm doing a crew talk next week. I'd love for you guys to join. You know, you guys are all huge names. You've sailed with everyone across the board. You're not afraid to sail with somebody that says, hey, come pull jib for me. Come do middle. Um, Ed Cox, we got a chance to win an invite last year with your son. Special moment. But guys, first thing I want to get right into is where did it all began? You know, let's date back a little bit to the youngster days, coming out of expos, coming out of youth sailing. Let's talk, how do you get involved? How do you start crewing on scows? I mean, take it away. Well, I guess for me, I'd started, uh, you know, I was fortunate to grow up in a sailing family. So my dad was taking me on an MC from a very young age, even before I started sailing expos and, you know, got into crewing that through that route. And, and, you know, as the years go on, you're just hanging out at the yacht club and you start building your network and, start asking people if they ever need crew and whenever they call you just gotta show up and go and you know from there it starts to snowball and so so begins your career yeah we've got a pretty rich tradition at uh, lake beulah of sea boats uh, we've got i think the biggest seaboat fleet in the country so um we do a lot of uh like when i was in expos i would always ask uh, i'd find the best sailors the ones who could get me trophies and i'd go ask them to uh sail with them so like kent hager was one when i was a kid that I always wanted to see who was sailing with him at Inlands or Nationals, but also came from a sailing family like Coy, sailed with my dad on MCs, you know, doing the boards. So kind of family got me into it as well. Yeah, and then uh, for me, it really just started in the Melga 17 crewing uh, for a, a variety of people, but it kind of took some time before I got associated and teamed up with a, with a set crew and regiment. So a little bit of sea boats, um, probably second team on MC when I was still doing expos, but, uh, it really was probably my first real program that I got on was with the old big daddy, Scott and Matt Ripke. Uh, Matt and I were buddies growing up and we're lifelong friends and they were nice enough to take me on. And then from there, it just kind of transpired. And Ed, I mean, you didn't sell expos, but you've been a part of the game. I mean, tell us a little bit how you got into the sport. Well, I, you know, Growing up in White Bear, I'd see the expo at Salem, I'd see the Yacht Club activities, and my parents didn't sail. And uh, I had a friend of my dad's give me a Hobie 16 catamaran when I was a kid. And I would just, 
every day wait for the breeze, go down on that, put eight or nine kids on it, rip around the lake, tip over, have a great time. And I got the chance to crew on some uh, keel boats on the St. Croix River, River that you're all familiar with when you cross over to come into Minnesota. And uh, so first boat I ever raced on was a Santana 20. And it's the ugliest, <laughs> dumbest boat. But I did a, uh, I went from that, that guy took it up and my first real big race was the around the islands in, uh, on Lake Superior, where my first introduction to sailing was losing the mast uh, about 50 miles from Bayfield and having a motor in with a little three horse Volvo motor. And I was 13 years old and I, I thought that was normal. I thought that just happened all the time. And uh, uh, so I went from there to a lot of offshore sailing, um, going to transatlantic. I was very fortunate to spend a couple winters in Florida racing big boats back when we lost the America's Cup. And, and, uh, uh, and so I was able to sail against all the guys that were training for the 87 Cup down in, uh, in Florida. So that kind of stuff got me. Well, time went on. I took care of a boat on the Great Lakes, traveled all over, sailed as much as I possibly could. And uh, we'll just why I'm a carpenter, because I never would go to school. I just would want to sail. And uh, um, then one day the owner of the boat sold the boat and uh, I got a phone call from a Pewaukee guy who was living in White Bear working for Skip Johnson. And he had lost his crew on his uh, e-scow and just asked myself and the guy who pulled Spinnaker for me on the, on the keel boat if we were interested in doing um, some scow racing. And uh, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, getting yeah. into that boat and sailing, still a big team boat, still crew, you know, and just the speeds and the one design part of it. And then, you know, bumping into all of you guys. I mean, there, there's not a hack in the fleet, in any of the fleets, you know, in yeah. any of the fleet, sea boat, EA, you name it. And, uh, um, and so I just, I just got hooked and, yeah. and, uh, and that's when I wanted to see my kids, you know, get into it. And uh, uh, so it was pretty cool. I had a lot of good influence. You know, David Ferguson got me into the expo, you know, told me I got to do it. Got to get your kids into it. I'm like, ah, we're going to go do this 420 thing. And I'm so happy we didn't go that route. Yeah. We did the expo. And uh, so, yeah, and we've got such a solid club here. You know, there's, I sailed a lot of good guys. So it was, it, was a, it was enjoyable. And I wouldn't give it up for anything. So, guys – just so you guys know, while we're doing this whole webinar, like, feel free to ask questions. Um, go down to the button that says Q&A um, in the middle of the bottom of your screen. And feel free to ask questions as we go. We're going to be talking a lot of different stuff. Um, it's not going to be what centimeter you should put the traveler at uh, from the lured rail in 15 knots of breeze. But it's going to be sharing war stories like Ed Cox just did. And um, we're going to basically shoot the breeze, like you guys already know. And we're going to start off, like I said, with where it all began. And like everyone goes around and says all these little things about, Coy talked about growing your network. You know, Colin talked about, you know, getting his hands on any boat he could sail on. For me, I think I had the same kind of gritty mindset of, I don't care who you are, what boat you have, no matter the year, no matter the conditions, no matter the lake, every single time you're on the water, you're learning. And that's kind of the way I thought. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about the arrow. It's about the Indian. So first race I ever won was at John Zills on Lake Geneva. Shout out John Zills if you're tuning in. <laughs> um, MC Legend, boat named The Good Boys. And John yeah. Zills and I went out, big breeze, 12-year-old kid, won the race. So I quickly want to wrap back into it. Coming out of Expos to Colin, Coy, Ben, I mean – you guys were 16 years old looking, you weren't boat owners yet. You didn't have like your parents didn't buy you a sea boat. Your parents didn't buy you a mug of 17. Um, you know, how do you continue to learn and grow your sailing knowledge by crewing? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just then, yeah. So, so basically, um, I, I think some other people might share a similar sentiment, but uh, my parents grew up sailing, but they weren't heavily involved in it at that time. Um, now they've obviously become a lot more involved, but they weren't sailing themselves or had their own boats. 
So I was fortunate enough to team up with a few family friends who put me in a position to learn right away. Um, it started with an M17 with, with Mike Sims when I was probably 14, and then I sat with him a little bit. And then it transitioned to some other um, more stable scenarios with bigger fleets, more competition. But I, I guess if there was one large takeaway, Will, it was just being available and, and a kind of go-to guy. Hey, we need a guy. Who are we going to call? Well, we're going to call this guy because we know, we know he's going to show up and he's going to do his job. Um, going to be reliable. Yeah. So. And it, sometimes, I mean, going down to the Yacht Club when blowing dogs off chains, 20 knots, and you're sitting around doing nothing on a Sunday morning, stroll on down there. Have your mom or dad bring you down there and just say as many people load their boat into yeah, the water. Hands, hey, down, hands down, that's the best thing you can do. That's the best way to get on boats. Best way to do it. Four thing on an e-scout, thirty on a sea boat, seconding on an MC, or, you know, seventh thing on an A-scout. I mean, I can't remember. Buddy Melgus brought on, it was either Griffin Rolander or Matt Ripke in the 2010 A-scout Inlands. And he looked at one of them and he asked, who's lighter? And I think he had, Griffin Rolander just lied and said he was 10 pounds lighter than that, and he got on. <laughs> so. uh, for me, it was uh, Brian Brickler, actually. So I did sail with my dad for a year. We uh, rented uh, – Lake Beulah had a sailing school sea boat, so we rented that for a year and kind of co-steered. That had kind of fallen out of the sailing scene. I was running track at Wisconsin. Um, and before one summer, uh, Brian Brickler called me, and, um, and so he kind of lined me up to sail with Marty. Um, we sailed on the lake that year, but Marty didn't travel to, I don't think we went to any regattas together other than maybe a WI. And he lined me up with Frank Davenport to go to Inlands. Um, and I was probably 18 or 19 is my guess. Um, but, you know, sailing with Frank was a totally different thing than sailing with, uh, you know, with Marty. And we had a lot of fun. We went up the day before and uh, I was blowing like, I mean, it was blowing. And so we sailed with the Okaboji. They had their lake races. And I think we had like 350 pounds on the boat. Everyone had thirds. So we were kind of just hanging in there. And then, of course, the regatta itself, uh, you know, we basically got out there and it just, I think there's only two races. It's not even a regatta. So, uh, but sailing with Frank, you learned so much different from Marty. And you just, you know, as I sailed with more and more people, you just take different tips. Everybody likes things a little different. But it's always, you know, I mean, it's the fun of sailing with new people and meeting new people and, you know, making lifelong friends with everyone who's, you know, maybe, you know, Marty and I and Frank and I aren't the same age yet, you know. I mean, I sit with Frank, you know, I now coast here on Beulah, and I sit with him for four hours every Saturday, you know, after races, drinking beers. And, I mean, that's the fun of it is getting with, you know, different generations and everybody's got that same, you know, that same passion. Uh, I think that's uh... – that's a big part of it is is the mix of the generations you know if you look at our uh our uh able program you know the 50 year old guy pulling jib up front and then it just goes down in age all the way to the back of the boat and uh um for me it keeps me young you know hanging out with all you guys and and trying to keep up and and uh and just enjoying it i think uh, uh will's point about getting down to the dock and just kicking tires and trying to get on any boat you can uh, is uh, fires yeah and they, i mean that's a big part of every sailboat is those people who want to do that and be part of this you know all our skippers are amazing they're great sailors but like will said at the beginning they don't they don't get there without us and uh um and people need to understand it these crews are we're vital to the whole thing. We're vital to the number, the numbers of people that are in the inland or at the Chicago yacht club or anywhere, you know, I mean, it's crews and uh, um, not to discount the skippers. We wouldn't be there without them, but uh, yeah, it's uh, getting there. And you know, my path, I just asked every guy on the dock. And then I met, like I met Gordy Bauer one day when he came down, mm -hmm. just, uh, he was selling sales for keelboat. I'm like, I, I'm going to sail with him someday. I mean, he's the, he's the big dog in our area and, uh, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to be a good crew and sail for him. And then, you know, then a guy bought a brand new IOR boat up in Bayfield, Wisconsin. And I'm like, that's the boat I'm going on. That's the cool boat. And that just, just that, that drive to sail with, with really top notch talent is, uh, uh, was part of the fun for me. And it really moved me up 
the ladder fast in my sailing, you know, um, but I think you guys are right. You gotta, you gotta, you just gotta say yes to everybody and, uh, and everybody teaches you something, whether they're good or not, you know, so. Definitely. Yeah. Corey, break down your, I mean, upbringing, you sailed on a ton of different boats. You sailed M17s for a little bit out of experts. Um, you know, you sailed sea boats with your dad. Um, you got to crew on a bunch of different boats, even like before the age of 10. Yeah. So I, experts. yeah. So growing up really fortunate to have my dad work at Malgus and be able to go sailing with him at, from a young age of MCs and C's and, um, and whatnot. And then, you know, as you're a kid and you're going through sailing school every day and just to echo what everybody's already said, but if your sailing school ends at four and the club races are at five, hang out for an extra hour and, and see if you can get a ride, you know, what's, what's another hour at the end of the day, you want to go do it anyways. So it's, that's, that really helps you get going and it might take a couple no's, but eventually you'll get a yes. And that momentum will, will keep going. Um, so for me after, you know, it's just like that in sailing school, I'd hang out and, and want to go sailing be forced for people on random e-boats on Geneva club races growing up. And, uh, yeah, sailed in Malaga 17s after X boats for a little bit. And funny enough, Ben and I were actually crew members, team members on our first you know, official major program that we did together with uh, Andy Burdick, Terry Blanchard, Peter Keck, and uh, George Bukema to start. And then we had Josh Garber and George Kuchenreiter for a little bit. Um, but yeah, he and he and I kind of had a trial by fire when we first sailed in Avo the first time. And uh, I think it was blowing like, you know, this is May, water's cold, it's blowing, you know, 15, something like that. And Andy's like, all right, let's go, uh, let's go practice and we had never really done it before so we just you know trial by fire drinking from a fire hose went out figured it out and didn't what were you guys and, doing what positions were you guys so front to back at that point was uh myself ben peter keck uh terry blanchard the owner george bukema trimming maine and andy burdick driving gorgeous george yeah it was uh it was an interesting for sure uh you know first experience just Remember, we were out, we'd practice maybe like three or four times, um, but we did our first race. And as the two men, I'd never sailed on a boat with a kite before. So we'd put it up and down a few times in practice. But I'll never forget the first upwind buoy, first race. Anytime we were practicing, Andy would come, we'd be going upwind on starboard. All right, we're peeling off, buoy here, you know, set the kite and you just go and do it. Well, the first race, I didn't even know the rope I was pulling the tack, which obviously pulls the foot out to the end of the pole. I had no idea what that even did. And so as soon as we rounded the buoy, I just started ripping on it. Of course, like, we're not ready to set. Andy didn't call for the set. So the, luckily, Pete was so good that he kept the kite out of the water. But I had no clue. I was, you know, he's screaming at me. And I'm like, wait, am I not fast enough? You know, I'm just going harder. I mean, it was uh, definitely a different experience. But how obviously. Old were, how old were you guys? How old were you guys? I think I was like. You first started sailing with Andy. 22 or 23 19, it was uh something like that. yeah wow. the first race actually i had a college final and it was at i think the race boat time was 4 15 it was a three o'clock final in madison which is about an hour and 15 away so sorry to my mom but i finished that final in like 15 minutes and just booked out of there <laughs> to get to the race hey Talk guys we got being reliable yeah, yeah seriously right. hey That's really quick deal. guys Let's get rid of, let's get kind of into some questions here that kind of pertain to what we're talking about. Um, I got a question coming from Tom Groskoff. What's your favorite lake or venue to crew on? We had our last panelist ask this. So real quick, around the horn, feel free to start off. I mean, mine has got to be, I really like, I really like Oshkosh, but I thought. Why? <laughs> because of the wind and the waves <laughs> the big breeze not this no, last summer but and then uh i think another favorite venue of mine has got to be lake hopakong sailing with colin rowe and rj and the east cow easterns in new jersey which yeah. is basically like Pewaukee on steroids but like a 400 feet taller shoreline yeah. i'm a big okaboji okaboji's one of the most fun i mean it's just great. The Yacht Club's amazing. Uh, obviously, all the members put on a great time. The downtown's there. Everybody, what I love about it is, you know, sometimes you go to regatta and, like, 
there's other stuff to do. So everyone kind of like separates, but at Okaboji, everyone's in the same spots. Nightlife's the same. I mean, it's just great because everyone's always in that same, and not to mention the water's beautiful and always good breeze out there. I mean, it's just awesome to me. I go uh, Lake Mendota, Madison. Big open water, great race tracks, whatever breeze direction you have. And at the end of the day, you go sit on the dock at the Edgewater and, and uh, debrief. It's the best. Hang on. Oh, Mendota, yeah. I thought you said Mendota. I'm, I'm, I'm with Coy. I, I, I think that's just, I, as far as a raw sailing lake goes, that's one of the best that we have. Um, and that's probably Geneva for me after that, you know, because of the just the beautiful facility there and that everybody dry sailing and hanging out after the races and just adding that extra touch. That's always been one of my favorites. So. Yeah. Uh, Mendota is by far my, one of my favorite lakes here locally, but an effort of being different, I'm going to go with Minnetonka. I still think they have a nice open body of water. It's shallow. So you get some chop and it's fun when it's just ripping and sailing it. Um, Away, I would say if we're going to the coast, Little Egg Harbor. You're on the you're on the shore. You did the whole shore mentality. You get the uh, the south southeast at two o'clock. The sea breeze comes in. It's about fifteen to twenty. It's great. So really quickly, I mean, we're all talking about you know going to these events. I mean, as kids, I thought it was the coolest thing being able to pack up no matter who the boat owner was, no matter if it was us kids, I just really enjoyed like the regatta prep and like getting in a, in a big suburban with an East Gow or a sea boat and traveling, you know, eight hours or wherever you might be going up to uh, wherever with some of some guys you might not even know that well, or some guys, you know, super well and getting to the event, getting an Airbnb, getting a hotel, you know, that butterfly feeling when you first show up to a site, rigging the boat with the guys. I mean, that's all really, really new. And you do a little bit of that with experts, but you also do it with like a very youngster person, um, like a toddler and your parents. Um, and that was something that I kind of wanted to chime in on. Like when you guys were teens uh, out of experts, you know, what was the first regatta you got to go on kind of with your friends or, you know, without the hand-holding parent with the expo trailing on the back. For me, it was New Jersey with Colin and, uh, and uh, RJ, and we took Brian Porter's Suburban and just had a ball. <laughs> yeah, that Shout was out Brian Porter. Yeah, that was good. So for me, I would say um, my first traveling solo regatta with someone else, other than my parents or close friends, was with Jim Peterson. We were sailing on a sea oh, wow. national regatta on Lake Beulah. And I think it was so windy the first day that we couldn't sail. And the second day there was light winds. We only got maybe two or three races off, but that probably was 2007, 2008. Um, it was back there, but, uh, that, you know, it's Beulah. So I'm, I'm not spending the night, but that was the first, okay, pack your bag the night before, get the game face on, get all the lucky socks going. And then you're on the road. Definitely. I think mine was with, uh, I'm just, I, that's a great question. I was just trying to jog my memory. I think my first uh, regatta outside of parentals was uh, with Sam Rogers and Charlie Harrison, a seaboat regatta in spring. No way. Wow. That was that, good. I, I bet. think so. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. Just like those road trips. I mean, those road trips, you're, you know, at the time I'm a young kid and I'm just like, all right, this is cool. We're going to regatta. We're just guys being dudes going to regatta. So you're, this is awesome. Guys, we're going to do a lot of name drops in this whole throughout this whole webinar. It's going to be confusing, but you'll get the hang of it. And we're a tight knit group, but I mean, Ed's going to launch some names out here in about two seconds. And I've never, but still we're, it's, it's a part of it. We're basically just shooting the breeze. Um, hope you guys are tuning in, enjoying it. And, uh, you know, we were scheduled for about a little bit less than an hour, but Enjoy the ride. How about you, Ben? Yeah, for me, it probably was um, the Frank with uh, Okaboji uh, for Sea and Lynch. Uh, the first A-boat regatta we went to when Coy and I were with Andy. Coy drove ahead because he was working for Malgus. It was Crystal, right? Yeah, Crystal Lake, Michigan. 
So just riding up, it was actually just Andy and I going up because uh, I think Peter, Terry, and uh, George were working on Thursday. So we went up there and, um, you know, it was fun in the car with Andy. I remember it was NBA draft nights. So we watched that Thursday night maybe. But we got up there, Coy, Andy, and I put the whole boat together. The other guys showed up after. But I actually was talking to Coy about this today. It was funny. We put the boat in the next day, and it's a backup launch. You know, it's a launch. It's not a uh, crane. And as we put the boat in, you know, right before our first race, maybe two hours out, hour and a half, you know, as we're backing in, the bow goes down and goes to the trailer. That's what the A-boat has, you know, they're 38 feet long. And we had the gin pole on the, uh, on the trailer with the little um, whatever hook on the top of it. So, of course, you just hear the crunch. And oh. Peter's yelling at Andy to stop. And I just remember we were sitting there. And, of course, immediately it's looking at Coy and I. And Andy started, and he's like, hup, hup. he's like, I did that, guys, my bad. But he was ready to come at us for a little bit there. Ed, I'm going to throw you a different one. When was the first time you ever sailed with your kids? Uh, Whether it was Eddie or Kate. I had, a, I had an e-boat that I skipped on White Bear for a while, and uh, I would start to let Eddie uh, – Kate was pretty small at the time – because Eddie was mid-expo uh, career, and we'd go out and sail with uh, Charlie Helms, local guy, uh, uh, awesome jib guy, and and he would help us out a little bit, and we'd go out and have some fun. And um, I mean, asymmetrical. I, I mean, it wasn't that new for, uh, on there. I'm thinking way back, but anyway. So yeah, we sail with Eddie and. And, uh, and it was surprising. I mean, he, he started to figure it out pretty dang quick. And, and uh, um, um, he definitely had his own ideas on how he was going to steer the boat versus two guys sure. that I'm were sure. trying, to, trying, to, trying to give him some advice. But uh, oh. we hung in there. We hung in there uh, for every race, which was good. You know, we were in the mix going around every lap. And uh, um, I could see it. I could see the writing on the wall that this was uh, – we were going to have to get one to get him steering it because he was uh, he was pretty good at it. So, and it was, I mean, I wanted to sail with him too. So, this is a great segue into a question that just came out from your daughter. Kind of a high risk answer here, uh, Ed. Who's more fun to sail with, and why? Little Eddie, Kate, or your wife Emily? <laughs> Guys, just a little teaser here. Ed cruised for his son now on I-66, W-66, the Marvin. Um, and I got a chance to stay with their family, awesome family. Uh, super great vibes the whole time, uh, start to finish. But this is a great question, Ed. If you could sail with one of them over the other, who would it be? I might have just read oh, it. Uh, Come on, Ed. Putting the old man in a bad position here. Isn't it <laughs> Not really fine here. Yeah, this oh, it's a good tough. question. <laughs> Ed, there's people at home. Oh, oh Eddie, Eddie said, careful. 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 <laughs> careful. Well, careful. What's he going to do? I own the boat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <What> the hell? <laughs> oh, oh. Um, Come on. Come on. I'll, I know the answer. I'll tell you something. From an intensity standpoint, uh, Eddie is, is as intense as they come. And I think most of your, your great skippers in the inland are – cut from that mold I mean, they're yeah. uber focused and every little thing that you do slightly wrong or you, slightly Psychotic. wrong you get criticized for if you do everything right you don't ever hear about it you know and I think that probably goes from every good boat and every good skipper on and coy and i had some fun at the nationals last year talking about our e-boat skippers and having a little inside info on how we handle their uh their intensity and uh um you know, and I think that's a big part of being a good crew is you got to handle the, you got to be a psychologist. You got to handle these guys, you know, um, <laughs> back to the answer. I sailed with Kate last year with, uh, uh, Jonathan Starrick, who, um, is, uh, running our sailing club right now. And his daughter was captain of, uh, or still well, was captain of the Madison sailing team and just an all around great family that got into sailing really late in life. And they're, um, and they've been a great, uh, part of our sailing club now and uh we went out and skipped uh kate got to drive his boat and i got to crew with some really new people on board and uh um 
that's when I realized Kate is equally as intense as Eddie, but in a much <laughs> level or way, a lot cooler way about it. And I was, you know, it's not fair to Kate, but uh, I was shocked at how intense she was and how into it was, which is why she was good at it, you know, yeah. and, uh, but she handled it way different. So um, I'm just going to take both sides here, but okay. uh, there's <laughs> nothing, there's really nothing better than sailing with both of them. And when I have all of them on plus Will Prairie, who is a kid that grew up with us, is it just, I mean, I got two, in, two inland champions on, on board. I got a, uh, a blue chip champion and a GLSS expo champion and a uh, two time runner up. Um, with, I don't know, nine race wins in the inland. I got pretty damn good crew on my boat of experience. So, you know, for me, it's, it's the and best. And you. Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm a fine <laughs> <here>. Come on. <laughs> hey, guys, quick side story. Uh, Ed and I drove all the way to Montana together from Minnetonka this weekend. Thank you, the Cox family. They have a beautiful place out there. We went skiing for awesome seven days. But I rode with Ed and his truck the whole way, and their uh, awesome dog in the back. And, I listened about Kate and Eddie for about 14 hours. I mean, that was amazing. talk about a guy who just loves sailing with his kids. And uh, it's, it's awesome to see that he wants to continue to do it. And word on the street is Kate's going to be skipping an e-boat soon, but we'll see how that plays out. Uh, Perfect. Corey. I'm in. I'm in. You got Colin? my vote. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thanks, Colin. Wait, Will, did you see Vincent's question? I like that question. He asked, uh, what qualities do you look for as a crew and a skipper? And since uh, Coy sails with Vincent on the e-boat, I figured <laughs> we should kick that right to him. And yeah, I agree. Out. I agree. What his thought oh, process is on that. Talk about dealing Perfect. with psycho skippers. Vinny, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great. I, I think... I'll, I'll get this the number of years wrong, but we've Clifford, Vincent, and I have sailed together for seven years now, something like that. Vincent, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe it's eight. I don't remember, but they've all been fun years. I mean, um, you start off and you're just trying to figure it out, and you slowly evolve over time. But as as a crew, as a, just a team, as a cohesive unit, you're always just looking to get better. I mean, it's a cliche answer, but it's it's reality. So we have, you know, after regattas, we debrief on what we could have done better ourselves and other people. So we'll open and honestly critique each other. And sometimes you don't want to hear, the, hear what the answers are from other people, but at the end of the day, it makes you better. So it, it definitely helps. So that, that kind of level of trust and communication is, is huge. Yeah. Vincent Porter says, I don't want Corey's opinion, but <laughs> I've gotten a chance to sail with Vincent a couple of times. I think Colin, you have too. Yeah. Colin, I think you won an Eastern's event with them, right? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that was my first regatta I've ever won um, was with Vinny. And that was in 2013, Cayuga Lake, uh, Easterns. Vinny, don't bask in the glory. I'm about to shred you right now. <laughs> but uh, no joke, guys. <laughs> Seriously, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, it's going to be a lot of storytelling and there's going to be a lot of name drops, but this is what this is all about. And, uh, you know, thanks for doing all the Q and a stuff, keeping our uh, program going, but kind of to go off that of what Vincent said, like we're talking about young crews. We're talking about, you know, energetic, young, enthusiastic kids, 16 years old, 12 years old, eight years old. I mean, I can name so many young guys on Geneva. I'm sure there's so many on Minnetonka and Beulah that sail with their family members that sail with, you know, their aunt and uncle, um, whoever they can get their hands on. They're as eager as I was when I was a kid. But what's the best part about that? You know, having a young, strong, you know, super stoked kid on your boat, whether he's forthing, he or she is forthing or doing jib. You know, what does that bring to the table? Not just physically, but like mentally to a team. I, well, I think, you know, being a, coming up the way I did, but when, whenever we would add a new, you know, some of the crews we had were 10 or 12 people on these big keel boats, you know, so you're always bringing somebody new in and, and you're working them on a, on a new position and stuff. And, and you, you, you get them blue collar, you get them doing their job just perfectly. And it's absolutely exciting to see them start to get that figured out and then really feel part of the team. The A boat does that. The E boat does that. I honestly haven't sailed on a sea boat enough to give a good opinion, but it's got to be the same thing when you bring a good third on and they feel like they're part of the team. 
um, that just adds energy to the whole program, you know, and when you get done and that kid's smiling back there and, and uh, you're like, well, we just ruined another kid's life. He's hooked, you know, he's in for the ride. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I think that's, that's all of our responsibilities. All you guys are products of it. You know, I'm 55 years old, but I've watched all you guys come up and sail. And, and uh, um, it's, you know, it's an honor to be on this panel with you because you're, you know, the best in the inland by far. And, uh, um, and that's been fun for all my years, you know, just standing there watching it because I 25 when I started crewing on scout. So to see it happen, you know, and see where you guys came from, but yeah, getting a kid on and the energy they bring, if they're pumped, it's, Nothing better. So, yeah, yeah I agree. Go, Ben. Go ahead, go ahead. You got her. I was going to say it's infectious. I mean, I remember uh, back to the e boat, the I2 with Vincent and, and Clifford. <clears throat> and one of the first crews we brought on was a young Kyle Navin. And uh, as we all know, that guy is, guy is just a stud. So, he needs no introduction. And, and when you have that kind of energy, if you're in 10th in a race and you're trying to gain points to secure a spot in the event, you know, you get energy like that and, you know, it just puts you over the edge and makes you want to work that much harder and, and gets you the result. Yeah. I mean, I, I can remember our first style and Peter Peck and I won our first nationals at Nagawicka. The last Alex, uh, his son was our third and he sailed with us the first day. And the last day we didn't think we'd need him. Uh, so we put him on with his sister and, uh, Riley Schmidt. Um, so last race comes up, we're in the lead and it's blowing now and we need a third. So I can still remember sailing to a boat looking for a specific person who decided not to sail with us, but it actually was Christian Spencer just was, he must've been, I don't know, 10 years old at the time, nine years old. <laughs> and this person that we were trying to like on the boat, they wouldn't even look at us. And Christian was just holding his life jacket up. Like pick me, pick me. And you know, obviously threw him right on and was an intense last race. Obviously we're battling for an inland cha or a national championship. And I mean, there's nothing like having that enthusiasm and he was just ready to go right away. He was like, you know, put me on, let me be the one that gets to jump on this boat. I mean, that's what you need to have when you're a young kid and you want to, you know, like I said earlier, I mean, I, I would ask Kent Hager, Hey, let me be your, let me be your third at the inlands. Let me be your third at this regatta. Right. So just got to have that enthusiasm for sure. Yeah, and, and to that point, that's exactly how my younger brother got hooked uh, on this infectious disease of sailing, <laughs> is when I started sailing with Brian and Brian's son, RJ Porter, um, I had to have been about maybe 14 or so, so my brother was nine, and you know, as a typical nine-year-old, he's happy about just life, so it was almost humbling because it didn't matter if we had a terrible start and we were in last place, he was smiling, kind of looking around just happy to be there and then even if we were winning by a mile it was the same thing so it was like it, it just a very comfortable and humble reminder of just like hey let's enjoy this let's just be along for the ride um and then hey, now, we got a question colin kind of going tiptoeing yes. you know the 49 um you guys have been so successful over the years uh a question interesting for this username bill the fifth uh, Colin, how often do you light Brian's cigars around the offset? <laughs> Every set. Is, Every is set. That a myth? Is that Every a myth? set. No. Um, no. That's, Keeping your skipper <laughs> happy, though. I mean, come on. Well, no. That the, the the truth of the matter is, uh, we all know he likes cigars, but no, I, I that does not happen. But you know, back to the point of being reliable and being there. If he'd asked, we probably would. I would do it. I would we probably would, it. would. We just haven't crossed that bridge. I would totally do it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's it, being a part of a, a young team, even like whether you're sailing with a bunch of old guys and there might not be somebody under 30 years old, like it's still fun. Like when I joined, when I first started sailing a scouts with the G force before it was kids, when it was Tommy wool, um, Kevin Jewett, um, and a bunch of like Tom McGreevy, um, and a bunch of guys, like I was the youngest person on the boat by like 20 years Don't and Robert I was Mahoney. trimming pipe and wow. Robert Mahoney. Yeah. And I mean, it was just a ball being able to like end races with them and go like, listen to them talk or, you know, just absorb every piece of information that you could. And I think that's the biggest thing we all want to say is like, be a sponge, 
Like I sailed with Ron Schlamer, who's an absolute goat on the I-11. He had a 1989 A scow, the Poseidon I-11, and I was an exporter. And he asked me to come trim kite on his A scow, and I was like, I don't even know what a kite is, let alone trimming an A scow kite at like 15, 14 years old. It was a trip oh, of a lifetime. It was a trip of a lifetime. It was like eight knots, but I was still just like feet on the backbone, like <laughs> just squatting every single trim and ease I had with my back. Yeah. But that was hooked. I mean, I, I got a roll with T Fry tag the following year at Okaboji. And then I was picked up by the G Force, but it's like little things. You start showing face at some of these events as a fourth, as a third. You get asked to do jib, you get asked to do middle we all know how it goes and then you, you just sail with everyone there are a couple of people who asked uh what are like the most important qualities of a good crew what are the qualities of a super crew maybe we let ed take that one to start yeah ed come on qualities of a super crew yeah what super makes a good crew, crew good crew come on um talk about the grit well yeah i mean you got to be there all the time, setting the boat up, putting it away, you know, whatever it takes, you know, like for an A-boat program. I mean, when that thing's on White Bear, when it was on White Bear and we were working at it, I mean, I was Will's number one guy. I was always there, always pulling the boat out for him, always helping him, always doing that thing. So that's just kind of the, the blue collar work that you got to do to be, to be a really good crew, you know? And I think, you know, for me and all the crewing I've done and the people I've crewed with from Gordy on the E-boat to, you know, to a bunch of the white bear, top white bear guys and stuff, you know, each guy's got a different personality and each guy's got a different way of sailing. And I think that adaptability to, to you know, I, I mean, I primarily pulled jib my whole life and uh, um, being able to adjust to their styles and communicate with them and feel what they're doing and just be that you know, you, you take everything you learn from everybody else and you put it in the, in the bucket, but you got to, everybody's a little different. And uh, I think that really comes down to, you know, what makes just an everyday crew from a guy who is, uh, uh, you know, top tier, you know, because Ryan doesn't sail the same way Eddie does. And Gordy didn't sail the same way Billy Allen did. And, and, uh, you know, I've sailed with Lee before who's listening in and, and he sails one way and, and, and you got to work and adjust to, to all these guys. And they're all great skippers. They just got the way that their way they're sailing. And I think, I don't know, I think all you guys, you know, maybe chime in that's on nice. that. But I think that's a, a big part of it. And, uh, um, and you got to be able to block them out too. You be able to block them skippers out sometime and just do your work no matter what they're yelling at you, you know, and then just, and if they have that risk, if they have, you get it done for them, they, you gain that respect, and then you, you can get away with more on the boat, you know. Uh, uh, you know, definitely. So, I don't know what you guys think, but sailing with guys is, uh, you got to adapt. Yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, growing up and you get those reps of just asking people to sail, this is going to be a confusing answer, but I, I think you guys might agree with it, is you have to be a generalist and a specialist all at the same time. You got to know... You got to know how to do it. So if some guy needs to be, needs you to pull jib one day, you got to know how to pull jib pretty decently. And the next day, if he needs you to be the spinnaker trimmer, you got to know how to do that. Um, and then once you get established with a, a team, you know, you kind of set your roles. You know, if, if I'm trimming spinnaker on an A boat, I don't need to worry about what the tactics are. You know, I got to worry about the traveler, the eight to one and the spinnaker. And that's kind of my world, right? So I don't need to think about the chess game that's going on. Um, so you got to, you know, develop your skills to get to be able to plug and play wherever you can. But then once you're in a spot and on that race for that day, get really good at your role and, and know what your role is. 100%. Yeah. That was a really good answer. I can touch back on what Ed said is the communication piece as well is like if I take it back to sea boats, everybody likes things a little different. You know, and I sailed with Marty Barr, the first thing he wanted me to hit, if a puff hit, you know, get me that uh, – uh, cutting him in right away uh, with Peter he'll always say set the boat up to hike right so we're not going to depower the boat until we really can't keep it flat right um, you know and then there's other people that 
obviously the vang first. So communicating with the skipper knowing, hey, when a shot hits, what do you want me to do first? Should I drop the track? Should I pull the vang? Should I pull the Cunningham? When you come across the boat, what's the first thing that you do, right? Uh, when I sail with Pete, which is what I sail with most of the time on a sea boat, you know, when I'm coming across the boat, I'm hitting the bang as hard as I can as soon as I get across, because that's what he likes. But if I see that, you know, we're basically up on an ear, maybe we roll tacked a little too much, not realizing that there's a big breeze on the other board, um, or get caught under the boom a little bit. If I know he's going to dump the sail, I'm going to hit the Cunningham first, because if I pull the bang in, <coughs> it's not going to matter, right? I mean, he's already dumping the sail. I don't want to put the sail in the water. So there's little things that you kind of learn, but I think the communication aspect of asking like what do you want first what do you prefer and then you can ask people like why do you want that first right um you know that type of thing and obviously is going to be huge just for your, your team as a whole right i mean if you know exactly yeah. what he wants and he knows what you're looking to do right away you can kind of get a little bit more in sync and the more time you sail together the better you're going to be you know i mean the more events you can do together i mean more sailing you get better and better and better definitely yeah, no, so so you guys really just touched on it all, and you said it perfectly. I mean, you know, you nailed it in terms of the qualities, but to put it really simple, and this is something that Brian Porter always says, and he said it to RJ and I when we were very young, starting on that team in 2010 or 11, and it's just everyone do their job. job. That's it. It's very simple. It's sweet. It's easy to remember. It's just everyone do their jobs. We can all focus on just what we do and not what everyone else does. Bill so, Belichick, we're on to Cincinnati, baby. Do your job. Do your, do your job. job. Do your job. Do your job. Do your, do at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Colin, you're right. It's a team sport, and controlling your skipper is just as important as skippers controlling their crews. And you can hop on boats and think that you might be more smarter than the guy that's steering, and you might be just completely throwing him jargon that he doesn't even understand. I'll throw a story out real quick. I sailed a sea boat with Cullen Barr one time on uh, Lake Beulah, just on a random Saturday. And uh, we were going down the breeze, and Cullen was talking about how you can dip into the island and see if you can do an end around on everyone. And uh, I was like, Cullen, like, come on, you got to really soak low in this. you got to really soak low, like really try to ride this puff down. Soak every single inch out of this puff. And after the race, he goes, Will, why do you keep saying soak low to me? What does that mean? And, and still this day, he talks about the story. He's like, I, whenever someone hops on my boat, I use the term soak low. We need to soak low in this. So everyone has their own jargon. I've stepped on other boats and heard just the most outlandish terminology for like pulling the vang on, like pull the kicker on. I've heard just absurd things where I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And but some it's of Go ahead. So, sorry, well, I was, I'm laughing to myself because I'm thinking you're totally right. Everybody's got their own different jargon. And if you're in the intense, like, heat of a race and somebody says something like, pull the, pull the kicker on, you're like, you can't help but just start laughing. And you try to, you, you got to laugh facing forward so the skipper yeah, doesn't you see you see laughing. It. But I mean, that's, I can think of a few scenarios where that's happening and you just start laughing and it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty, it's, but I think that story. brings us, I think that brings us into our next topic of, you know, like front of the boat versus back of the boat communication. I don't care if it's, you know, like an E scout, a scout, even a C boat with a third on boat, like you're talking with the guy who's thirding on a C boat just as much as you're talking to the four guys in front of you when you're like a fit on a, on an A scout or whatever. Yeah, at, and absolutely. So like, your skipper might just yell, like Coy just said, the most outlandish term. He might have called you the worst name in the book. But you always look like whenever I'm doing middle, like I'll always look to the jib man and I'll be like, wow, what a cherry. Or just something just to loosen the vibes. I think everyone can attest to that. Like, well, I think there's a lot of – in my whole career um, – With you your know, son? It, it, you know, back during the symmetrical days when a when – jib guy we'd hoist and the, and, you know, the jib guy goes under the boom all the time. I mean, not, now we're up, now we're up on the high side and we actually, people actually know us before we just would disappear under the sail and you wouldn't see us till we rounded. And, uh, um, 
but the amount of discussions we've had about the conduct of the skipper between the middle guy and the front guy as we're going upwind, it, I mean, I have endless stories with them where we're, you know, we're, we're, we're making comments and, and when I'm training a new crew, like my nephew, Connor, who sails with us uh, on the A and he'd be right behind me and we'd get the three guys up front and, uh, and we would talk about <laughs> loosening up and having fun up there as we're watching the skipper or the, or whoever in the back lose their mind because things aren't going well. <laughs> and, uh, uh, which keeps it fun, you know, and the longer the boat, the farther you're away from the skipper, the more fun you can have. So, uh, True. Yeah, ton of that. Yeah. Will, we, did we have any of that at the invite last year? We had absolutely every single, that was the other thing I wanted to ask you, Ed, is like, how do you go from a father figure, an authoritarian figure, like laying down the law, boat owner, sitting in the gym position, and having your son just lay at you with some like <laughs> very, very volatile terms. Eddie's well, an awesome guy. I know Eddie's tuning in. I love sailing with Eddie. I'm going to sail with Eddie on Sundays this year. But I mean, how do we keep these psycho skippers from just jumping off the boat? Well, you know what? They are just that. And they are amazing at what they do because of that. And I've come yeah. to the conclusion that, that the best of the best are – so damn focused and so intense and each one of them handles it different. I mean, I, you know, I, I Gordy Bauer called me up one day and said, Hey, I'm going to Lake Geneva. This is right about when the, when the boat works was the year before the boat works trans the wiper or uh, Johnson transferred over to, uh, to Melgis. And so Gordy, loft was barely hanging in there and and uh and he had made a new set of sails and he hadn't sailed an e-boat in a long time and um calls me up and goes i got mark christensen going um and you and diane and we're going to e-nationals on lake geneva want to go well yeah i want to go so i hop in we go we get down there at midnight he's got the boat set up the doctor and i do a bunch of work to the boat the next day before a race starts and and we go out and sail and Gordy was just quietly intense. I mean, just precise and to it and super intense. And then I've sailed with other guys that are more verbal and louder, you know, and, uh, 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 and Eddie, when Eddie's grooving and he's in it, it's amazing. You know, it's just amazing. One of the, and not just cause he's my son, but one of the best guys I've ever sailed with from that standpoint. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, when things don't go right, then it gets to be, you know, a conversation. Well, he loses the control. You know, when you're a skipper and you, and you lose control back there, you can't untie the knot that that's up there and whatever, then it gets a little wound up. But, but, um, I've had to learn and he's had to learn that, you know, the father son things got to kind of separate when we get on the boat. He's the skipper. He's making the calls. He's telling us where to go. He's doing what he needs to do. Um, and I need to step back. Very difficult. I'll tell you that as a dad, you know, I love him to death and I care a lot about him. So when things aren't going right, you know, you want to put that father hat on and step in the way. And, um, but I think it's gotten better and better. Our success, you can see it. Our success is, can consistently gotten better we're you know we're sailing fairly well and uh um and it's been good you know but it is hard it is hard and i i think a lot of dads have that i've talked to carl spencer about it he's got two amazing sailors on his boat that know everything and they and they do they're great but carl's also a pretty experienced old guy sailing the boat and he knows what's going on too and so they've had a little they've had their conflicts on there and us dads to lose our our know-it-allness after a while. Let's keep it on that track. Colin and Finn or Colin and Ben talk about sailing with siblings, like family members. Well, I, mean, well, I haven't, I haven't uh, sailed with my brother uh, on a boat consistently, but I will tell you because of this coronavirus pandemic, I've been quarantined at the lake. So I'm available for Tuesday nights. So it's given me the pleasure uh, to start sailing on the G force. And the best part about it is that everyone already has their spot. And they're like, okay, you can either do six or be on two. I'm like, all right, I'm a front of the boat type of guy, so I'll go up there. But I will tell you, it goes back to Brian's old adage, which is everyone's got to do their own job. Because our first upwind, and we're kind of just speed testing with yeah. the new 49 boat. And the whole time, 
and it's ripping too. I'm not focused. <laughs> you know, I, I'm pulling the vang. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But I'm just totally focused on the jib, and I'm in Finn's ear the whole time. And I realized I was like, you know what? I'm not even doing what what my biggest saying is now. It's doing your own job. Um, but it, it to, to your original question, it's a blast. I love it. Uh, it is yeah. different because you are brothers and you're so close and you're very competitive with each other. But at the end of the day, when you step foot on a boat, you just, everyone's a teammate equally and everyone's doing their own job. Um, so it's going to be get, fun sailing the summer on Tuesday nights. I can attest to that. The first time we went out the other day, uh, I sit middle and, and Colin are right next to each other. So they're right in front of me and I can hear every single conversation that they have front of the boat communication completely different than what Harry and RJ are saying in the back of our boat, like all the time. And uh, I mean, it's just constant like, what are you doing? Come on, like, come on, get the hell out of here. What are you doing? Come on, drop coil of attack. Yeah. Like yeah. it's well, not he, uh, he's, he's the jib fin. He's, he's, and, you he's, know, Finn's, Finn's no slouch. So at the same time, who am I yeah. to get to the degree? Uh, but Ben, you have a big sailing family. You don't really sail with your family. I mean, you sail with Peter in the sea boat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my sister Anne sailed on the um, red eye with us uh, for the last two years, I believe. She was our seventh and came every single Tuesday night. All their God is everything. So she was, um, it was just the last year now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so I've sailed with my sister Anne a little bit more. Last year we did the E Nationals. It was the last year, two years ago, that was at Oshkosh. I sailed with my dad, my brother, and my sister Anne. I've sailed with my sister Christine and Katie. I mean, it's always fun when you get out there, um, but, you know, we're always more competing against each other, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's a little different in that aspect of it, but, uh, you know, anytime you can get out and, I mean, I think that's the fun part. My mom judges the races. If she were going on Lake Beulah, obviously non-coronavirus time, uh, you would be able to see, like, my entire family, every single one of us is out there sailing at the exact same time every Saturday and Sunday, so... It helps you, obviously, from a family standpoint to stay close with everyone as well because, you know, so many people move on. Me personally, I live in Chicago. Like, I don't get up there. But every single weekend in the summer, you just see everyone, and everyone's very like-minded in that way. Definitely. And sailing with the family is the best. Ed summed it up the best. Colin, you would both. Like, at the end of the day, you might fight a little bit um, on the water, but as soon as you get those sails down and the race is over, I mean, everybody's Jones and having a good time no hard feelings but i have a good question that came in from my mom and connor connor i wish i had a last name here but mom thanks for tuning in and uh my mother just asked a great question as well as connor if you're a young boy or girl that has no experience at all on boats crewing on scows how do you put your name out there to crew connor asked specifically what advice would you give someone who's trying to get on an A boat? Oh, that's easy. I mean, if you're at Geneva, Connor, I don't know what lake you're on. I'll assume Geneva, Minnetonka, or Pewaukee, but figure out what the uh, the race schedule is. And about 45 minutes before the race, just go right where everybody puts their boat in the go water, in. either the crane or ramp. Just life jacket in Park. hand, like like that Christian Spencer story. Just life jacket up, like pick me, pick me. And it, it'll probably take a couple no's um, or a couple of weeks of no's, but eventually some the conditions will be right. Somebody will need to have you on or somebody won't be able to make it and, and you'll get hooked and then you get in the rotation for alternates and then you get in the rotation for regulars and you start building your network. Not to just, just park it at the ramp. Or yeah, park it, park, park it, it, park it at the Bring crane, a lawn chair. park it at the ramp. Bring a lawn chair, bring a snack back, I mean, the whole thing. But yeah, you got to no you got to be in somebody. You got to be in their face. They got to know. Got to be in their ear. Yeah, they got to know you're there. Um, yeah, help people at the pier. I mean, that's another thing. After the race, you're out there helping them fend off the boat. You get talking to them. I mean, you know, the more in the mix you are, the better chance you're going to have to meet somebody yeah. who might ask you. Might not be this time, like Will said, but might be the next time. Right. And that's, I think, a good thing to say for any boat, not just A boats, but like NCs. I mean, the fact that yeah. I literally didn't even know who John Zills was. Shout out John Zills once again. But he was the first race win of my career. And I was immediately hooked and I was sailing an MC. I mean, I loved the MC, but it was not the most thrill ride. I think I was on the low side the whole time. But we won the race and I was hooked. So 
it just takes a lot of time. My aunt Ellie, Ellen Vogel, um, Ellen Roberts, uh, she didn't sail on an A scow until she was, she's 55, I'll give her that. Let's just say she's 55, she might be younger or older. Um, but like, it is tough and you just gotta throw your name out there and sail with as many people as you can and just shoot your shot. There's no, nothing wrong with getting them out. Um, but we had a good question from Will Hager out of Beulah that I think can spark a little bit. And I think this will be a good way to wrap up some of our conversations, answering some of these questions, uh, really juicing up the conversation. Will Hager, I've had this conversation countless of times with people um, at the bar, at the dinner table, on the water. What fleet has the best sailors? I'm not going to say mine. Until uh, the great end. question. Sea Scout. Best Hands cruise? Down. Best cruise? Everything. Everything. Sea Scout. I'll stump for it. I mean, I, I'm unapologetic. I'll, I'll stump for it. You guys can answer politically correct or dance around the answer, but it is the Sea Scout. Hang on, well, let's, skippers. Let's just let's just toss out the easy one. It's not the A fleet yet. I mean, it's no. We need, we need some more boats. boats. Yeah. Not enough boats yet. So it's between for crews. We'll we'll throw out the MCs too, since there's not a standard crew to yeah. make our decision. You can just easier. throw the MCs out. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> throw the MCs out. Sorry, MCs. I love guys. a good MC though. Yeah. Um, it's a crew. So it's a crew. Yeah, webinar. as crew. Yes, yeah, a crew in <laughs> seminar. Um. E's or C's? Come on. This is so That's easy. Tough Coy. One. <laughs> no, Coy, it's not C boats. Hang on. The I need best somebody cruise? in my corner, Coy, come with me. Come the on best, over. The, the best, best cruise. The best cruise. If, if it's the best cruise, I think it's E boats. If it's best all around sailing as far as the whole package, the C boats have a pretty strong case. I agree. Yeah. Are yeah. we talking talent or quality of race? And I think we got to stay cruise. So I. I, we'll say cruise for the cruise podcast or seminar hey. or whatever. I will you say this for the e-boats, Ed. It's e-boats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just hand down, hands down e-boats. Uh, I've been in a sea boat twice, so you can uh, you can understand where I'm coming from. But uh, probably got wrong. You, if you look at the number of guys that are, uh, you know, the middle guys. I mean, for example, our boat. I mean, if I have my whole crew on there, I've got some, I've got skippers that can drive that boat and they're crewing onto my boat, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, Will Crary is our A-boat skipper and a, and, a, and a good one when the team's going and we're doing it and, uh, and an inland champion on his own, you know, so if you start sifting out each one of the guys at each one of their positions in an E-boat, these guys can jump in and steer other boats, pretty damn good sailors. Plus, you know, Coy talking about, uh, the amount of skill it takes to be like you're the jib guy, but you might be flying the kite for, you know, cause of injured reserve, you might slide back and a guy might go in. So your, your ability to rotate and do different positions. Now, now I will say this, and this is just being political correct. There's some really good sea boat guys who sail in our e-boat fleet too, you know, and in the A-boat fleet, the red eye was a prime example of that, you know? Uh, so we're just lucky in the inland guys. <laughs> There's a lot of good people here. And I, didn't start sailing in the inland until I was 25. So I came in late and was wowed by the whole thing. You guys are all rats, grew up in diapers in this thing. So, you know, but uh, it's still the e-boat. Sorry, I'll end it at that. <laughs> I'll end I'll end yeah, e-boat. E I mean, look, the, the, the truth of the matter is I'm probably more biased because I've sailed e-boats for a while. But uh, recently, between Coy Herrett and I, we've started sailing the sea boat. And that has become very humbling to say the least. Um, crew, back to the old point though, e-boats, um, not by far, but e-boats ahead uh, in terms of crew work. We're I claiming will say Andy, we're claiming Andy for the sea boats. I think he's got like yeah. 41 <laughs> inland championships or something. So we'll count that on our ledger. You guys, you know, yeah. you can count all the other <laughs> people on your ledger and we'll, we'll add them up. We'll see. Um, I agree. I will say like, I tell this to H3 all the time, or H4. Um, little Harry, I said, Harry, until you win a Seaboat Inland Championship or a National Championship, I mean, what worth are you to the, uh, like, you got to get in a Seaboat. Put on the leech cord, go downwind on Lake Beulah with 45 boats and see if you can make something happen. 
Yeah, it's insane. It's just a different well, type well, of I, what, what I will what I will say, and Ben, you'll probably appreciate this, is what was just absolutely marveling to me when we started sailing sea boats is how every boat is relatively the same speed. Yeah. Yes, there's boats that are clearly faster than others, but they can't be that much faster than each other. They just can't, unless one is taking on water or has some serious damage to it, which makes it an incredibly tactical and uh, maneuverability race. It, and, and, you, and it goes to the first weather mark at most of those regattas when you have 70 sea boats. And it's so neck and neck where it really comes down to boat positioning and then tactics. Yeah, it's the sea fleet, uh, you know, Colin and I sailed last year in it and coming from symmetrical downwind, we just got our lunch handed to us many times. Uh, you know, we, we sail around kind of reaching and uh, was like, all right, what, you know, this is what we're used to sailing with downwind, where's the spinnaker? And then I, Andrew Bull came out to me one, I think it was after one of the few that got, he's like, dude, these things don't have kites. Remember, just go straight down wind. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, thanks. Well, yeah. I will say though, that's one of the advantages to being a crew. You know, I mean, For if sure. you guys had both been, obviously Colin, you hadn't crewed on a seaboat, Koi, probably not since with your dad. I mean, when I first started steering a seaboat right out of Expo, it's just getting killed. You get in with, I mean, that's one of the advantages to being a crew is you learn all the little nuances of the boat. I mean, if you want to be a great e-boat skipper, if you want to great, be a great sea boat skipper, it's okay to put your work in for a couple of years, pick up the pointers that those skippers are going to give you, and then use those when you move on to steer your own boat, right? I mean, yeah. there's so much that you can learn from the good people. And the great part about the Inlands is everybody's willing to, you know, they're willing to help. Like after the races, get around everybody, get into the conversations. You know, you're going to hear different war stories from 10 years ago. You're also going to hear about what happened on that race course. I always think it's funny. I have a bunch of friends who aren't sailors. And I was like, well, what do you guys talk about? Like after a race, like, what do you mean? You're just sitting at the yacht club. Like, I mean, it's just, it's all of that. And that's how you can start. You know, you don't have to start as a skipper right out of expo. But you can go learn a little bit, save some money, get through your college. When you're ready to jump into it, you're going to be, you know, better prepared for sure. Yeah. I tell you what, Ben, you, you know what you tell them, you tell, or go ahead. Ed. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, ben, it's, you know, I'm, I got into, uh, when I got into the e-boat thing, I did it for a couple of years with uh, Donnie Nelson was his name, W12, and uh, won a bunch of champ, champ series on our lake with Jewel Hannaford and Bob Zach, and uh, just a pretty strong fleet back in the day. And I kept eyeing up an MC. I'm like, I got to start skipping a boat. I mean, I'm 26 years old. I got to start steering my own boat. And I got the MC and quite my first time rounding the mark. I rounded, I don't know how I did this. Emily was sailing with me. We rounded first and I took off like I had a kite up and the whole fleet passed me, <laughs> you know, and I was like, okay, I got to go downwind. Um, but the amount of help that I got when people saw me sailing that boat, whether it was you know, I got a lot of help from Gordy, which was great, but, uh, um, with the local people in the club and techniques, how to sail the boat, what to do. I think that's one of the strong things about the inn. And I think if, if you had Eddie on right now, when he moved down at Geneva and he was trying to jump his game up in, uh, in the e-boat thing, you know, I mean, obviously he's seeing Harry every day and, and stuff at work, but, uh, uh, Brian was really open to and, you know, to talking about setup and what to do and it's things that take, you know, um, it made him a much better sailor. And I think that goes through the whole fleet. I mean, the sea boat, you know, when I sat on the board and the sea boat was doing its stuff with its youth thing and building it, you look at that and look what that class has done to help the, help the fleet come up. And then the ease learned from that and they're doing their best to, 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 to do that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's a great thing about this class and that stuff comes down to you and then when you start skipping all of a sudden you're a skipper you guys are now sailing sea boats and you're you know great yeah. e-boat a boat crews you know that's yeah that's a that's great stuff look at coy Herod. i mean no one knew he actually knew what a tiller was and he came out and sea boats in Minnetonka <laughs> and just absolutely laid it down and same with colin, he had a good I mean, boat. colin colin will go out and steer his dad's e-boat throw it down ben will go out and sail sea boats and throw it down i mean you look at some of the best crews in the inland, they can all steer a boat yep. pretty freaking well. 
Yeah, that inlet. I had Ben's sale for that inlet. That was a fast sale. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Ben. That was the key. Like ten year old so, sale that you had. That was great. <laughs> we got we got a good question from uh Jewel Hannaford. Jewel, thanks for tuning in. Uh Jewel just asked, uh, what's it like sailing barefoot versus wearing shoes? This isn't even a debate. You gotta wear shoes. Yeah. You, right? What? Yep. yep. I'm big you gotta shoe have program. shoes on the boat. Big shoe program. If it's this a is, Sunday morning and I haven't raised my sail yet, and it's blown five knots of breeze, eighty-five degrees, and I'm sailing a sea boat with turf, you got to put the Nikes on. Nike, shoes. Nike fly nets every day. I never, I never wore shoes till I started sailing on an A boat. And no offense to Melgis, but there's no non-skid on the A boat. Okay, and I had a switch to wearing shoes. But I, I didn't wear shoes ever. And it got to be, people would ask me, it's, you know, it's the blue chip. You putting shoes on? I'm like, no, it's 30 degrees. And uh, Jewel was at this regatta and Russell Coots was at that regatta. And uh, there's a great shot from Sailing World of uh, Brian and John and then W12, the boat I was on, a front shot, 30 degrees out. We got more clothes on than we could bring with and you can just see my bare feet sticking up. And I had to do it. I could not put shoes on. It was just against the rules. But uh, uh, I, I think sailing barefoot's the best, but the new boats are so hard to sail without shoes on. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just dangerous. I would agree on an A boat, shoes no. on 110% yeah, of the time. Um, on an E boat, I'd probably most of the time I'd throw shoes on. C boat, I'll never put them on. Not once. Doesn't matter if it's blowing 30. I want to feel the hiking straps when I'm jumping, board down, just jumping into the straps. I want to feel it across my foot as I'm jumping into it to know it's there. I'll never wear shoes in a sea boat, but everything else, I agree. I mean, an e boat or an A boat, you know, you never know on an A boat when you got to jump on, the kite gets wrapped, you're on the yeah. bow, the bow has nothing. Like, you have to have shoes on in an A boat, in my opinion, or an e boat to be successful. If you're the skipper or the owner, spot you might get away with uh, the no shoes but I don't think any of us are uh, quite in that level yet on this chat yeah I, I mean, look I'm a uh, I'm a huge shoe advocate because I like to be grip and also being very prepared to be a cruise crowd, crowd uh, sailor I'm always uh, anticipating some issues to be happening uh, back in the expo I can't tell you how many times I sliced my foot open on those bailers because we pretty much just kept putting more Vaseline over it to open it. And the whole thing was just, you'd, you'd put a foot on the ground and then you'd slip out. So it kind of, I've always been fearful to sail without shoes because of the expo. But I will tell you, it has become more increasingly common to shoe barefoot, obviously. I mean, look at this panel, um, with the exception of Koi and I. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll try it out. I probably won't. But uh, there's something to be said about putting the old stinky shoe on and then going sailing. I think the I, other thing, Coy, before you answer, I think the other thing is, is you're talking club races. Can I wear shoes? Coy, you're telling me if you're sailing a club race on Okachi with Shannon, Shannon is his girlfriend, you're not throwing on, you're throwing on like socks and Nike Freeze? No, you don't wear socks. I'm not a Coy sales and socks. Uh, Colin Barr sales and socks. I'm just going to leave that there. Crazy, crazy. Shout talk. out to Cold Dog. Uh, yeah, Cold Dog. but I'll. It's part of my like pre, if I'm driving or even crewing, if I'm going sailing, it's part of my pre-race thing to get my mind primed yeah. to go, go sailing. So it's part of my ritual to get on the water. Funny story about Colin and his shoes. So oh, yeah. he sailed the sea boat last year and the first couple of regattas, we're sailing, it's you know nice clean boat on the inside. And then all of a sudden there's these little pebbles and I, carry my shoes to the dock and then put them on right before I get on the boat. So they'd never touch the dock or pavement or grass or anything like that. Uh, and here comes Colin. He just walks through like the biggest mud path that you can find. <laughs> He's got rocks stuck to the bottom of his shoes. I'm like, dude, you're going to step on the boat with those. Come on. And he's like, yeah, what? I don't see the problem. Yeah. Boat owner well, versus that, crew. Was the ex that was the exception of Colin sailing, sailing barefoot is, he rock, he walked through a rock pile in some mud. It was the first race. We had to kind of just start to the bottom in terms of uh, just roughing the boat up a little bit. We built right. that up. We got to put the first scratch in it somehow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just got to get it over with. Yeah. 
Uh, There's last last couple of questions coming in right now. Billy Madden just asked, shout out Billy Madden. Uh, you know, what happens Billy. in breakdown? What happens in breakdown scenarios? Like, there's so many things that can go wrong when we're sailing. We have a lot of engineer type mindsets, especially crews. Um, there's always that one guy or a couple guy that's got a Leatherman on his hip, you know, electrical tape in his life jacket, stay tails around his earlobes. Like there's always that one guy that's going to look to just jump and fix it without anyone watching. And I think that's key to putting a, a crew together, especially yeah. e-boats, a-boats. It's a lot more important there on a sea boat. You know, things could break down, but it's not going to be quite as, bad when you have three sails on the boat versus you know one um but i think you've just got to know like who can fit you know like the key is one guy can be fixing something especially if it's breezy out because that's when most of the breakdowns happen and it's the rest of the guys in the straps hiking you're not watching you know for us on a boat it was always peter peter had to jump in anything broke you know coy and i would be sitting in the straps if pete for us on Andy Burdick's boat, Peter would call the wind. He would help with tactics. Um, obviously, when Peter would go in and he's got his head in the boat, he can't do that. The um, Whoever our, was pulling main would basically take over that tactics with Andy. And then whether it be Coy or myself, you know, we'd just talk it out. Who's going to call the next shot, you know, and basically just don't watch the guy fixing everything. Like, yeah. there's right. one person, if he needs help, he can do that. But what happens is everybody just turns – gets on the side of the boat, it's blowing 15, and you're just watching what's going on. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous. You gotta just let, you gotta know who's your most mechanically sound person. Like Ed, you'll know Papa Cooch when we were on the red eye. Papa Cooch was our guy, you know, yeah. like something breaks that was, you know, send him right down, right? right. I mean, it's, yeah, I bet you it's you on your boat if I had to guess. On the A boat it was, I did a lot of that, you know, unless obviously if I'm focused, downwind especially, but, uh, um, uh, I was like that on the keel boat too. I was the go-to guy, you know, when it came to, to, to fixing stuff and going up the mast or whatever, whatever it needed to be done. Um, on the E, if we're going up when then, then Will's an engineer. So he's got, and he's, he's smart and he's small and he can get underneath the deck if he has to. So, you know, that's kind of, he's kind of taken that spot for me on there, but then it's because Eddie and I are trying to work together to go upwind to your point of uh, just let him go do it. We got to focus on what we need to focus on and get going. And, uh, um, but I think it's key. I mean, that's a great question is to have that guy that you know is the go-to guy, you know, and, and, and that the skipper's comfortable with too, because he's going to be losing his, you know what, in the back of the boat as Barbie. things are going right. And if he's confident that that guy's going to pull that out, and get it taken care of, then he's way more focused and being focused yeah. in a bad situation. Um, if you only lose three boats versus six, big deal. Win yeah. the regatta, you know, yeah. win, you win the regatta, you know, if everything goes perfect and you hit every shift and you get start, you're going to win the regatta. It's easy. Yeah. It's, it's the guys who can ha handle the issues that win the regatta, you know? Yeah. Not you say to it's your worst race that wins the regatta. It's not your best race. Like, how good can you do it in your worst race? That's what's going to do it. Who is yep. it uh, calling for you guys on the I-49? It's oh, usually – Brian. isn't it Brian Colin? Doesn't he just let go of the tillers? He, he, yeah, he puts it in uh, auto control, and then he comes up to the front. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's RJ. But I'm sure Brian's working on some type of self-sale process. Uh, no, but RJ is great. And just a quick – little thing we talked about sailing with uh, son and fathers earlier. And I just got to give RJ and Brian credit because those two guys have sailed together for a long time, but they've recently really put it together. And now they're starting to do more 24s and some other boats, but those two guys are special. And I think it really comes down to communication. And uh, you know, I'm sure everyone has, has sailed with that. I mean, Koi, you sail with your dad, so you can probably relate but if you, but it's cool this from my perspective because they hit a certain point where they just don't even have to talk. They just know exactly what they're doing without speaking, and they're both in unison doing the same thing at the same time. So communication, identifying it's issues. A long term. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, calling RJ. You. RJ asked a funny uh, question. He said, uh, "Give a your best tip over story as a crew." That's a good one. 
I like that one. Let's get into that. Anyone right out of the gate? Oh, I yeah, got, I, mean, I got one. I got one. I, I, got, I got one. The blue chip. I, I can take one real quick, just because I nearly lost my pinky. Go, oh, let's um, rattle them off. From from RJ, but we were sailing. It was uh, 2015, 2015 uh, East Scow Inlands yeah. on Geneva, and it was the second day. Big win, absolutely ripping. Where there was postponement for a while, and then finally the breeze went from like 25 to 20. Like, okay, we can start a race. First beat up, round it, and I think we're in second place fighting for first. And we're going along on a starboard jibe with T-17 behind us. And we go for a port jibe because we're on ley line. And there's a huge shift all of a sudden. So now we're on port. T-17, we have them. But they get caught in a big heater, a massive heater. So the, And he can't. And he has to head down because if you don't, you will flip. So inevitably, we thought we could cross – he got a puff at the wrong time. There was calamity. I'll leave it at that. And he hit us to the point where H4 and H3 and Finn were behind us. And they said, we got hit so hard from the rear that our boat literally went about 15 feet in the air, flipped and immediately turtled. So uh, it's funny that RJ asked this question. Maybe he asked it for, cause he knew that I was going to tell his story, but you know, we're all there. It's like, holy shit, holy crap. We just got hit by a massive, you know, puff. And then now we're tipped over. We got both dagger boards up. I have ropes tangled all over my legs. Um, so I'm like grabbing onto anything, but we have heavy fall weather gear on and we have these light life jackets. So I, I want to get my person on the boat to a secure position. And the only way yeah. to do that is stick my fingers Yes, it is stupid, but I had a moment where I had to do it, and I stuck my fingers in the gudgeon of the centerboard um, holder with the centerboard up. As I do that, RJ, to his credit, is trying to prevent something like what's about to happen happen, so he pushes the board down as I'm pulling up and about to be free. Centerboard oh, comes oh. down, cut. it hits my finger, uh, lift it up. As I lift up the centerboard, I – pretty sure that I lost all four of my fingers because I have a glove on. I can't really see and I'm kind of in shock. And as I take it off, I was actually smiling because I, I only had clipped part of my pinky. Everything's fine today, but uh, that that was certainly a good story. Say like a wannabe Buddy Melvis. Oh my God. Yes, trying to be Buddy. Um, I have a good one really quick. Um, Expo Chiel SS, no, Expo Inland on Delavan. And uh, I was in the starting line. There was like nine general recalls. Like, I think they threw up the black flag. And I didn't really know what was going um, on really in terms of my sailing abilities. I didn't even know it was a black flag, to be honest. I was just out there sailing. And uh, I kind of knew RJ at the time. He was, that was his last year, Expo. That was my second to last year. And um, going into, like, the ninth general recall, I'm like, it's got to be a general. It's so light. Everyone's over countless times. And I go through this big roll tack, kind of, like, right by RJ, too. Go for this big roll tack in the X-boat that probably wasn't that big. And uh, we tip. I, like, fall over and miss my strap or something just ridiculous. And I hear, like, a horn. So I'm like, oh, another general recall. Thank the Lord. So I get on the center board and I yell to RJ. RJ's like in contention to win the event. And I go, RJ, is it a general? And he just looks back and goes, no. My meanwhile, my crew, Cameron Dano, shout out Cameron, is in the water, like 40 yards away, swimming, saying, I have to pee. And I'm like, dude, get in the boat. Like it's an actual start. So that was my best tip over story. I had one at, uh... Probably none of you guys have had this happen yet because it was a symmetrical spinner curl. I might have to describe it to you guys so you know what it looks like. But uh, we were at the blue chip, uh, full fleet at the blue chip, typical blue chip weather, blowing 30. Uh, just we're going. You know, I'm like, we're not sailing today. No, we're going. You know, and uh, get off the line and uh, we're looking pretty smart. Get around top five hoist the symmetrical up and uh we're on the uh, west end of the lake no room we got a jibe you know it's just so skipper's yelling for a jibe 
I get up on the deck ready to, to uh, pull the pole off and, 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 uh, and do what I need to do. And I look to my right, and Robbie Evans just eats it hard. I mean, he just gets whacked. Look over, Burton goes, Tommy goes down. It's boats tipping over everywhere. I'm like, oh my God. And I, and he's like, trip. And I get the pole, I get it across. And as I get it across, I hold on to the mast with my elbow and I look behind and all I hear is runner. Donnie's yelling at his wife. She's going for the backstay and she misses it. And I'm like, we're done. <laughs> and I just hang on to this, ride this thing over and down we go. Uh, flip over, look around, and there's 10 of us laying upside down. I mean, it was the hand of God came down and just ate the whole fleet up. And, uh, but that's just good blue chip stories, you know, but that, that was one of my best rides. And it was nothing scarier than being on that or fun being on the bow with a symmetrical up when it was blowing that hard, you know. Well, guys, we could talk for hours and hours and everyone knows, but we got to let you guys go. I wanted to keep it going, but we're scheduled for an hour and a half. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. Shooting the Breeze with Bill. Join us next week for the brand new panel as we take you on a journey down the run line. Thanks again, Dave Berg, Lee Allness, Beth Wyman, Candace Porter, and everyone at the IOA. Shout out to Sales Inc., Coy Harrod, Ben Porter, Colin Rowe, and the savvy vet, Big Ed. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. It was an honor. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. That was a lot of fun, and there were really some great motivating stories that you told, and I think when you think of the IOYA, you think of the lore, you think of all of the experiences, and you so eloquently shared so many of them tonight. Your enthusiasm is so contagious, and it's no wonder that the IOY sailors are the best. And you're such great competitors and yet so much fun. And I just want to thank you, the participants, the sponsors, and the organizers for being part of this event tonight. We'll see you on the water. 